to earn more money but too busy to start a side hustle? Do it the right way and teach your money to make more money for yourself, even when you're asleep. Dale Corpus will show you just how here on the School of Cashflow. With his entrepreneurial mindset and extensive experience in real estate and finance, Dale will help you become a responsible, strategic, and passionate passive real estate investor. Learn how you can increase your earnings or find more ways to make money, only here on the School of Cashflow. Good evening and welcome to the School of Cashflow podcast. I'm the host, Dale Corpus. So my guest today is one of my fellow Go Abundance Go Bros that I got to meet in person last month in May at the Commercial Academy Conference in Las Vegas. We we're learning more about triple net investing and the commercial, specifically the retail space over at that event. And I'm really excited for my guest today. His name is Maurice. He's a commercial real estate investor and his background is in the medical field. He's an anesthesiologist and he made the decision to invest in real estate in 2020. And he's really jumped into the commercial real estate investing space with a big splash. He's got rapid growth. I love that he's taking action and and, um, and, his, and, his, his, and his success is, is showing. And here's a little bit more about Maurice as well. Throughout their medical careers, Maurice and his wife have worked as independent providers taking pleasure in serving their patients in the Central Valley, California. In July of 2020, Maurice and his wife made the decision to begin investing in real estate. In early 2021, Cyrus Capital LLC was formed. And in a very short time, you know, their thesis changed from single family homes and multifamily opportunities to commercial real estate. And currently they own an 11 door property in Elkhart, Indiana, and a 63,000 square foot commercial industrial property in Vicksburg, Mississippi. So without further ado, ado, welcome to the show, Maurice. How are you? Thank you for having me, man. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, again, for, for folks that don't know you yet, again, whereabouts are you, where do you, where do you reside? Where's home? Hmm. Well, I live in Central California, born and raised for the most part. Had a career, like you said, in the medical field. So I am a nurse anesthesiologist. I've been working in that field for about 20 years. I've always had like this, this really powerful desire to know more about finance. And so for the past few years, that was expressed in the market. And I would, where other guys like to you know, garden or whatever, I would spend hours reading finance and deconstructing companies and kind of investing according to my investing thesis. And, you know, so when a go bro named Joe Martin shared with me what he was doing in real estate, you know, whilst while many of the thoughts were a little bit different, you know, the understanding of the, the preservation and growth of wealth from a poor kid like me growing up, It's always been fascinating for me. Always. Okay. Well, tell me more. So it's like, did you start off in real estate investing first doing single family homes over in Central Valley? Yeah. You know, and t- like when did that start? And because you made the transition, you know, you know, to commercial real estate. People a lot of people shy away from commercial real estate because of knowledge gap, you know, they get scared of it. But like here you are jumping full force into it. I'm just curious to hear more about that progression. Hmm. Well, yes. Single family rentals. I've had just several, like many of the guys in abundance. I was always the most active person among my peer group. I loved investing in real estate. It was something that I could get in front of a computer and learn. And so, you know, the market was my first expression of that. And I had certainly had several friends that were investing in real estate, but, you know, it, it was nothing that was big or pronounced or really, you know, changing the course of a family's you know, legacy. I met a, a friend of mine. He is a orthopedic surgeon in Central California. He started a Sierra, P- Sierra Pacific Orthopedic yep. or otherwise known as Spock. And he built quite the surgery center and surgery hospital. And he's a fantastic giver and very philanthropic with the way he thinks and lives. And, and I just heard these stories about, you know, how much he gives. And so I had a chance to meet his wife, who was a, a person from my church who spent a lot of time and in, in serving other people. And so, you know, there's this, this couple that just their whole life was just b- built around giving. So I, I took a risk and I shared with Eric, I'm having these thoughts, not quite sure where to go, but I do, I do know that I wanted to do something big, meaning it's not in my nature to nibble but I wasn't quite sure where to start. 
And these events started kind of coming together at the same time. So I met with Eric one day after his clinic over at Spock here in Fresno. And he really kind of opened up to me about his giving, how he does it, how he creates his wealth. And it was the first time in my life that I've ever sat with someone who had built great wealth, not from a W-2 or, or sweat equity point of view, but a a person who created their opportunity, him in the form of this, this medical group, this hospital center, he created it. He was the founder, the founder of it, the creator, the innovator, the driver of the project. And it blew my mind. Certainly intimidated. Uh, I don't know if this could ever be me, but he seemed to think differently. And in fact, even my question to him, you know, I have this, you know, and it's just a little more than a twinkle in my eye. I know it sounds kind of stupid. He stopped me. First time I experienced this later in Gold Abundance, I would experience it a lot. He stopped me. He said, no, it's not weird. It's only weird to people who don't think like us. First time I heard that, and it was the first time a gentleman of his caliber used the word us with me. And, and I appreciate it. So he gave me some first steps. And I really started just doing the exploration that would lead to you know, investments. And I moved rapidly between thought processes. So here's houses and multifamilies and Airbnbs. And I went through it all. But what I saw were folks spending a lot of time on busy work. And I didn't really want to. I didn't want to buy and sell 100 houses. I wasn't looking for the change of sweat equity from one to the other. I, I feel very fulfilled in anesthesia. So that wasn't the business that I wanted. That was another grind. Yeah. And so I started looking at bigger multifamily, setting up teams. How do I do that? And I uh, pursued some folks that he knew and they gave me more. And then the, the real inflection point for me came when Joe Martin told me about Go Abundance. And he said, he gave me the number for how much it cost to get in. I told him it's crazy. He called it tuition. I said, you're crazy. I'm not going to give these guys 10,000 to hang out with them, you know? And he just really, I trust him very much. And he pushed me and I just did it. And that was October of 21. So this represents about seven months to the day since then. And so since then I bought that the portfolio of 11 doors in Elkhart, Indiana. I bought the 63,000 square foot asset in Vicksburg. I have been under contract with the property here in North Carolina, about to enter contract with another. So, I, I mean, I could realistically expect to take down three to six properties in this asset class in year one. And that's a direct result. I gotta tell you, that's a direct result of go abundance yep. to get around human beings that, that, that want you to do a little bit more than talk about it. And the more I talked about it and, and shared with you, Dale, it stopped being a twinkle in my eye and started being real as I saw other guys who had done it and feel like I am one of them. Yep. So I didn't have to go lift a, a world. All I had to do was run with my tribe. I want to unpack a few things that you said. I mean, I, 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 I too have, you know, the, there's been a lot of trajectory growth by joining Go Abundance. I mean, I could relate to a lot of the things that you're saying. I mean, it's like, like, for example, you had a lot of just mindset shift that had happened, even from the, when the conversation of Eric, because it's as if you thought, you know, what you're doing is weird, but he made it, again, he made it seem like, no, this is a, this is normal, like, and you belong here. And you didn't see yourself belonging there and, you know, going that path at that time. But I think that was kind of like an enlightening, you know, that was a like, turnkey moment for you to say, oh, like, really? he thinks you belong. Maybe you didn't think you belong, but he totally thinks you belong. And I love that we have the synergy. I mean, we're both over a good abundance. It's one of those things when we meet the guys that are doing big things and you just really talk to them and get to know them. They're no like, they're no different from you or me. No. They're just not, you know what I mean? And it's the, like, it, it makes us realize the, we could do this, you know? The action uh, with, with, with the want. And, they, it, it, you know, I know this is a little bit off topic a little bit for yeah, talking okay. about wealth, wealth building, but it's fun. I mean, you know, to, to be around people that you view as your peers, it's just flat out fun. It's, it's the conversation I want to have. It's the conversation that I had by myself. I was limited by the information that I read without any real practical approaches to building wealth. Yeah. It was almost like a person who studies about the world, but doesn't get to travel and see it. That's kind of how I was with finance. 
And so Go Abundance, you know, the rubber hit the road and, and, and it was fun. And, uh, you know, I, I wish I could tell you it was just about the legacy stuff, but I feel like for the first time in my life, I don't know that I've ever, besides my faith walk, ever felt like I belonged in a group yeah. that I wanted to be in so much and that whose participants I admired so much until I got to go abundance. Okay. I can definitely say, I mean, I just met you last month, but I would have no idea that you just got in, you know, recently got into commercial real estate investing. The way you, you know, the way you do your business and this is the way you, you, you present yourself, you're very, very purposeful. And I don't know if that came, if you're always like that, even when you're in, in doing an anesthesiology, but I'm just kind of curious. It's like, where, like, how, how, where does all this, you know, where does all this dedication to developing this business and you're just, you, you're so purposeful. Where does that all come from? Huh? Well, I, I would say that it's absolutely not natural. Let's be clear. I, I don't know that it was always me. I, I was always on the move, even if I didn't know where I was going. And quite often it wasn't a good place. But for me, it started, you know, 15 years ago, I was about to be a father. I was aware of my immaturities. I had this kind of faith that I didn't want to live out because it, it cost too much, at least in my mind. And so for me, it started with that kind of spiritual change where I was ready to leave the life, in my opinion, of a child. A lot of us don't feel comfortable calling it that. But when you have a, a, a framework or, or mental reality that it, everything's kind of revolving around you. Yep. And there was something about knowing that my children were going to count on me. And this woman who was willing to say I do to me was going to be counting on my ability to cast vision for a family generationally. And for whatever reason, it emotionally hit me like a ton of bricks, not in a negative way, but in a, a very solemn way, a joyful way. Yeah. Like I was just, just ready to answer. So it wasn't loud. It wasn't a party. It wasn't something to tell everyone about. It happened very, very quietly, very gently that I was ready to grow up and lead a family. And so for me, the intention, intentionality of that and just infected every part of my life. So, so the things I did, the words I said, the plans I made as a father, a lot of guys take it for granted, right? You know, it's what you're supposed to do, but that's not the life I lived prior to that. So once I, once I was committed to a life of being intentional, it, it, it impacted everything. Okay. Everything. I'm, I'm, I get it. And so like a, a curiosity is like, you're going into commercial real estate. I mean, I, I take it you are still, you know, working as a nurse anesthesiologist still too. Is, is that correct? You're balancing out both. Mm -hmm. How do you balance? No, I don't want to stay. I don't want to stay this busy for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's no fun putting 20 hours in an operating room and then 50 hours, you know, into what you really want to do. But, uh, at this stage of my life, I don't think it's fair to my wife to kind of put her and my kids in in a tough financial position. So if I want it, then I got to go get it. So I just asked for her forgiveness for one year okay. and to let me get after this with the, with the idea that that I you know I have a great deal of faith that once the once the processes are in place that I'm building and I have been building are allowed to just kind of run smoothly that it will mean less work in the long term. And that's what I'll work for in 2022. And she is willing to forgive me and she is willing to let me do that. So that's what I'm doing. Okay. One thing I could say is that you're a massive action taker. A lot of people, you know, they want to get involved in real estate investing, but they keep analyzing and analyzing and then they, they never pull the, you know, pull the trigger. I'm curious. I mean, you don't, you you didn't you know come up in the real estate space uh, you know you weren't a realtor or you're a lender or anything like that it's just like i'm i want to know how did you getting into real estate investing is, is scary okay what was it that you know put you at ease to be able to even take that first step to, to even take down your first multifamily? Hmm. well i think that the, the main catch is it, it nothing I don't, I don't mean to be funny with your question a lot of people in our space in the real estate space, 
Uh, and I'm going blank on his name. This is my COVID brain. He's a, a, a speaker, a motivational speaker that has a, a big organization that teaches folks how to think and interpret things. Yeah. Uh, he has these six pillars of needs for every human being. And I won't get into all six, okay. um, but it is certainty, uncertainty, love, and significance. There's two there's, there's two more, but I won't get into those because I was interested in the ones that affected my wife and I. Yeah. First time I heard that, I was thinking, how could you say certainty and uncertainty? That makes no sense. Who needs uncertainty? Well, she started to explain it, and that was me. A lot of us, I think, have this little dentist and menace in us that is just a little risk-taking. I don't think it's an accident that you find a lot of people in our group that got in a little trouble in our youth. We had to get called to the principal's office a little bit. It, it, it's a little bit of a high wire act. And there's just something in us, if I'm just honest, that loves that feeling. Maybe we drive too fast in the car sometimes. There's, there's a certain kind of personality that comes with the space. But I think the interesting thing about this, the, the commercial real estate space is you don't have much room for self-deceit. And what I mean by that is you're told by everyone, if you don't go about your business in a, in a smart manner, you will get your head handed to you. So no one wants to lose a couple thousand dollars on a house flip, but it's not going to end the life of someone. You could lose millions in one deal with, with, with laziness. So a part of the, the CRE space in my mind is it takes a human being that knows who they are. And that's kind of rare because if someone says, okay, you can get in this space, but if you're not who you say you are, expect to get your head locked off at sooner, sooner or later. And so you have to answer the question, okay, this space is a space for people that won't let any uh, stone be unturned. It won't let any bow not exist. Loose strings can't work. Yeah. that uh, you won't miss anything, that you will outwork your peers. This is a space for a high-end achievers, you know, uh, and, and, and in every space, there's people who are putting in their work on a time card. That's not this space. So if you aren't who you think you are, it can be very painful. And so even though there's a lot of us that live in self-deceit, when we're forced to to make a decision or pay a price for that self to see, well, we'll kind of say that's not for me. But when you know that you are built for this, and it's fun when you hear it from other people that are wiser than you, that you are built for this. I think that's the whole thing about this space. I don't think it's a space to be comfortable. That's why I like it. Every single deal has turns and it is advers it could be adversarial, unlike homes that have all these government protections you're buying from another person who might be a shark and most sharks aren't looking out for you mm -hmm. so uh, it is buyer beware so your your ability to to take the appropriate steps make the appropriate decisions under sometimes a lot of duress and i have felt some duress it's not for everyone right. if, if you if you can't walk up to the to the podium to get married with ev with the, everyone there and the rings are out and you can't walk away at the very last minute, this isn't for you. Yep. It just isn't for you. You're going to be disappointed because many of these guys know the time to push is at the very end. So I'm learning very quickly that you sometimes get the biggest curveball with about 14 days left in escrow. And they're doing this to get something they want which fundamentally changes the deal and they'll put it in a take it or leave it form and it's ruthless. And so I've experienced that no less than three times now and a couple I was able to close and a couple I wasn't. And so those bad deals could lose to lead to a lot of lost capital. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't have the, the spiritual wherewithal to say no or goodbye or to walk away from the deal, this is going to be a pain business experience. Got it. No, I got it. Going, knowing that, you know, you're all in commercial real estate investing. I want to just double check. What, what are your commercial asset classes that you're focusing on and, and why? 
Currently industrial because it's where I did my training first, took down my first deal. If I, if I'm frank at first, I was kind of everywhere with this shiny thing syndrome. And one of the things I am really, really good at is listening to the advice of people that have what I want. Now, when I say have what I want, I don't mean money, but they're equipped in such a way that I want to be equipped. They, they have sound decision-making. They have a uh, a history of success that's replicable, that's plottable, and they demonstrated it over and over and over again. They demonstrated integrity. They demonstrated leadership. So when I see that guy, I'm all ears. And so when they say something, I listen. And Jake Harris gave me some great advice. For those of you who don't know him, he's the, the Catching Knives author and he has a great podcast. But uh, he said, to master a class, master an asset. Once you master that asset, some of them relate. Like there are ways industrial and retail relate, but they're different. But but there's a whole lot of basics there. So master something first. And then once you feel like you have taken down five or 10 deals, now see what's next. Surround yourself with the right people and then do it. But for me, I was kind of everywhere. I had an opportunity to buy 50 single family homes in Ohio. I thought it was a very good deal. I had no freaking idea how to arrive at a value for these. So I took that opportunity and called a buddy and and who who knew what he was doing. He was able to benefit from that. And I didn't get, I didn't dive into something that I wasn't equipped to handle. So uh, I I think you, I, so I think the message is to, to focus on the asset class. And if you haven't mastered it, don't jump around too much until you do. You can move asset classes and guys do do very well, but it takes time for that mastery to occur. And you got to do some deals and, and have to mitigate, mitigate some issues. And so for now it's industrial, which usually by definition has a little office because many times it's 90%, 10% industrial to office on the, in the asset itself. I want to ask you about geographic areas where you're, you know, you're investing in. Catch me up on that. Like what area or areas are you investing in and why? I tend to stay in red states. There are a lot of opportunities in other states, no doubt, particularly the Midwest. I think the Midwest is a, is a great place to invest for the long-term cash on cash investor. You don't get a lot of growth, but you get to pack, you get to purchase assets cheaper. The rents are, you know, pretty, you know, congruent with rents in other areas, even though the prices for the asset is cheaper. Okay. So you would think, well, why not go there? Well, the, the asset is, isn't depreciating quite often in those areas. And the tax liability in the Midwest states like Wisconsin, Ohio, Indiana are going to be significantly more than in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Texas, Utah, Alabama, Mississippi. So all these red states are going to have significantly less insurance. As an example, when I I was interested in a property in Illinois, it was in Winnebago County. This particular property was $14.4 million. And so the year prior to that, the owner had paid $167,000 in taxes, which is a lot of money. So being a novice, not evaluating that percentage in my head to the 14, if I would have, I would have realized that that's a very low percentage for Illinois and probably not accurate. So as we dove into our due diligence and found out that the tax rate in Winnebago County is the highest in the country, somewhere between 12 and 14%. That's unheard of. So even California, where I live, this is a pretty expensive real estate state. It's not 14%. Right. That means on a million dollar property that every year you pay $140,000. Who can do that? That would be more than your mortgage. So they got a lot of funny stuff. And so I, I didn't want to deal with that. And in North Carolina, the deal that I have been under contract with, the, the, the interest rate was 1%. Yeah. Uh, it was an appreciating environment. So it's my, it's my approach to do the legwork, even if it's harder, to get the below market deal in an appreciating environment and play the long game because it's what I believe in. And I will get an asset under control for myself and anyone who trusts me to invest with me. I'm always very honored by that. And uh, we buy it, position it, and let it give us money for a long time. And every five years or so, removing the value from that asset and and, and refinancing it. So 
That's why I prefer to be in areas of the country that are appreciating. And I'm hot on the tail for a deal I hopefully will have in the contract in the next seven to 10 days. To give you a sense of this, the uh, population is growing uh, an average of like 7% a year. That's massive, right? That's massive. It's because there's a massive amount of people moving into the uh, Charlotte North Carolina area and that secondary triangle in Illinois, the, the, the population hasn't changed in 50 years. In fact, it has continually shrank. So that should be disconcerting for any business over time. A shrinking population, high, you know, high taxes means that for them to subsidize their, their, their more robust government programs, that they're going to have to take more from the remaining citizens. So I, that's just not a long-term play that I'm interested in. That makes sense. Are you able to, can you describe like a, just a typical deal that you you're looking at or you would go for? Uh. Yeah. So I've got several ideas and you asked me what kind of deal I was interested in. There's been a little evolution for me because I keep, I keep running across properties that fit the buy box right. for many of my GoBros who do a self storage. Okay. That wasn't in my buy box before, but I'm opening up my mind to identifying properties with GoBros and partnering with them so that their mastery of the asset would take precedence over my lack thereof. So I look for buildings greater than 20,000 square feet. Uh, I look for buildings with a little acreage. I look for buildings in great markets and sub-markets. In the states I'm in, it's just about every market. I look for great tax areas where the tax burden isn't as great and the, the local regulations aren't as onerous. So what that typically means is I arrive at a red state, frankly. So obviously Mississippi and Alabama, they're not growing like, like the Carolinas and Georgia and Florida, but they're growing. People follow businesses and businesses are going to those states because they're open for business. An example of that would be, you know, in this, this last property that we've been evaluating and hopefully we will get under our, our control, you know, we were able to access a state, a state office that their whole reason for being was to connect local businesses with out-of-state businesses, including international businesses. Yeah. That's awesome. And they and they were they weren't there at our at our building to to hassle us. Quite the opposite. They were trying to collect the positives of the area, the submarket, what we could offer to international businesses, and got some very, very strong leads as a result of that. So these are the states I'd rather be in. They they want us there. They want the business there. They want to grow. And eventually it might even, might even be somewhere my family and I want to live. So that's why we focus on that. So industrial, and I would add industrial with the ability to convert is something I'm opening my mind to in terms of partnerships. Okay. I got it. A lot of people feel just uncertain right now because of the economy, you know, there's a looming recession coming potentially and whatnot. I mean, for you, since you're actively looking at deals and whatnot, are you doing anything differently to hedge against, you know, you know, any potential rocky waters that might be coming in the economic environment? Like a lot of people, I expect to see a lot of blood in the water. It happens during these times. And for those who are well positioned and well leveraged and have been sound decision maker, these can potentially be the times that springboard you into long term lucrative positions. So I'm not afraid of the coming recession. There's a, while I don't want to see anyone struggling to put food on their table, do so as an investor, I'm, I'm gearing up for opportunity. So what I'm doing right now is doing everything I can in the different properties or assets that I own to avail myself to as much capital as I can and as much dry powder as I can using it to finance itself. One of the things I would advice I would give to someone is if you're going to have a line of credit or a HELOC with an agency or a bank or a credit union, it would be to make sure you keep that money at another bank so that if they do a sweep or if they pull back on credit, it's certainly not going to do so, but you can put that money where you want to, to use it as you will. There will be an increase in opportunities over the next 12 to 18 months. So as a simple rule of thumb, you know, I, I'm looking for properties I think I can get off off market for 20 to 30 percent less. Yeah. I believe 
my process lends itself to a natural as a natural mitigant. It's a natural mitigant because if you buy something below market at the time, knowing that markets always return the way they are in some time, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in an appreciating market. So I don't think you could turn off the spigot to North Carolina. In fact, it's my position that a really bad recession will hasten the move out of states that are onerous for business. So it's not going to stop me from buying. Will my buy box get smaller? Yes. Because with more opportunities, um, I'm going to be more aggressive in pricing. It's just that simple. Another thing that I expect to see is our business has always had yahoos. The way that expresses itself is there's a property that's worth a hundred bucks and they owe a hundred or 110 bucks on. They are interest only. They're too spread out and too over leveraged. So when we see those interest rates rise and they cannot handle their, their debt service, those, those properties go to market. They quite often get foreclosed upon. And that's where the guys that are so positioned can avail themselves to that. And that's why I'm building up capital reserves as we speak. Yeah. <clears throat> Speaking of our off-market deals, because I'm not sure about your setups, like what are you finding as the most effective ways of of deal finding? Are you going direct to seller, you know, working with brokers, you know, just networking is all of the above? Hmm. By definition, it's all of the above, but my focus is direct to seller. So the direct to seller techniques, there's, there's really nothing new under the sun, unless you maybe add silent voicemail being relatively yep. new. But at some way or another, you know, cold calling has been around since telephones. So we've got phone, text, silent voicemail, we've got mail or some mixture of that. Yeah. There are several, several companies that provide good services for that. So we tend to focus on, you know, kind of texting and calling and cold calling and so forth. But I do know that guys have been very successful with a mail point of view. And so one of the things I, my research has kind of shown me here in the past several months is each technique works better for a certain class. So I plan on incorporating a little more of a paper mail, paper trail, because many of the, the older folks that are in some of these properties communicate that way or may not have a bunch of time to spend on the phone and may be more receptive to that form of communication. Okay. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I'm curious, if the, all the stuff that you're going on, you got going on, I know you, you've, you've assembled a team. Yeah. Yeah. Like how big is this team? And like, oh, just describe some of the things that you have people doing for you. Hmm. So I have, I do have the ability to underwrite, but I don't have the experience other people would. So I found an underwriter that could do some, do the work has, has under, you know, written everything from massive multifamilies to, you know, commercial real estate of all asset types, his skill set dwarfs mine. So given his reasonable price, it, it seemed like it was pretty reasonable to have him do it. And then I get to go over it and check his assumptions. So I have a, I have two virtual assistants that help me with reaching out to, to potential sellers. It's their job to kind of handle, maintain the platforms I'm on my CRM. I use Podio. So it's their job to quote, reach out to sellers, manage that information, package it in, into a form where I'm ready to insert myself, which is usually when it's when we're ready to talk to someone, I feel like that's my super skill is to be able to um, make someone feel comfortable with a voice on the, on the phone and come up with a plan that meets what they want or need and meets ours and make them feel comfortable about doing it. So I've had some success with doing that. So uh, they kind of tee the ball up, if you will. So in terms of people, you have a person that gathers the information. That's one. I have two people that synthesizes it and places it in the appropriate templates and a dat databases. So I have two VAs for that. The underwriter, of course. I have a for one of the one of the issues I had was so that makes what five so far. So one of the issues I had was I really wanted mentorship with these high end deals. So I put, put it out there, I was unable to do it. And so what I, I ended up finding this fantastic human being, his name is John Feehan. John has no longer works in the office, never shows up in the office, but has a 50 year career 
of just a massive portfolio of work for the biggest companies in the world. He understands what I'm doing in such a way that uh, is very deep and very intimate. What is, what's the definition or what does success mean to you? So I, I don't know that I have a big financial view of success. Mm-hmm. I've got more money than I ever thought that I would have. And I don't live a life that I need a whole lot more in terms of my personal self-care and my family's self-care. Anesthesia provided a good life for my family. And I, I've been investing hard for the past 25 years. That being said, for me, it's intertwined with my faith and there's no getting around it. So I want to be a man in the image of my Lord and Savior. That's who I am. And so I want to be a giver. I want to be a servant. I want to do it big. And I want to live my life out according to the talents that I have. And I want to live congruent to those talents, not swimming against the stream of those talents. So if I have an ability to cast vision, create synergies, I can create it where one's not there. I have, I believe, an ability to to share a vision with others and say, let's go. And if there's any risk, I'll take it first and go. I, I will charge a hill. And so, you know, success for me is being able to live in my talents. Deion Sanders said the other day in in an interview, they said, how you doing, Deion? He goes, man, life is good. I'm walking on my purpose. And this is a guy who's the best cornerback, cover corner of all time. He's now a coach. He he pulls like the the best recruit in in the whole country to this small, you know, historically black university over at Jackson. I mean, you know, and life is good. So that Success is probably kind of like a little Deion Sanders version, you know, am I, am I walking in my purpose? And if I am, I'm good. And if that means something bigger, that's great. And if it means not quite as big, that's great. But if I'm doing what I was born to do and made to do and equipped to do, I'm going to do some good things and I'm going to do them with my friends and people I care about. What a life. Are you kidding me? I'll take that. That's awesome. You're taking everybody for the ride too. Right. Growing up, to, you know, getting be able to successful together. Um, I love that. I mean, so what is your superpower? What's your superpower that's you know you know got you to this this so far in life? I'm able to go. I I live my life according to something I call the line theory. I share this with my children as well. Getting somewhere de- depends on knowing two points in time and space. Where are you going? And it seems like people can kind of figure that out a little bit better with a little help because that's kind of fun, right? I want to be bigger, stronger, prettier, handsomer, richer, or whatever your er is. The hard part is defining the point you're at. That's the hard part. David Goggins talks about it a lot when he talks about being more than you think you could be. Because so many of the things that are going to stop us from getting from point A to point B are internal. So my superpower is the ability to describe in myself reality as it exists, not as I, as I would have it. And based on that reality, create a plan and get from point A to point B and get there. I know it sounds kind of simple, but you know, I, I don't tell you how I'm going to get there, but I'm going to get there. And that's my superpower. So many times people can be physically good at lots of things. It actually inhibits them because it, t- it takes them on these journeys that's not from point A to point B. So my mindset is framed in that straight line. So the thing I need to accomplish that straight line is to know where I'm going. And I have to be absolutely honest with where I'm at, financially, mentally, educationally, academically, and relationally. So if I can get those things right, then I can start building the plan that gets me from point A to point B. If I lie about any of those, first to myself, that lie is going to be what torpedoes me. Got it. So I don't do it. My last question then is, how can somebody get a hold of you? You can reach me at my email, maurice at cyruscap.net. My website is coming online in the next seven to 10 days. So you can feel free to reach out to me on my email and I'll share that with you. And I'm obviously a member of GoBundant. So if there's any GoBro that wants to reach out to me and talk about synergies, I'd love to do it or just just do for him what a guy did for me. If he has some questions that he thinks sounds weird, I'll be the first one to tell him they're not. 
they're quite normal for people like us. That's awesome. Any final words? Any, any final words? Anything else you want to say? Or is there anything that I didn't, that I forgot to ask you? <laughs> no, that's it, man. Thank you for having me on. You know, you just, you know, you just have this super powerful communication. I, I sat next to you for quite a few hours now. And that one little trip to the commercial academy deal that we attended. And uh, dude, you can listen. And I've seen you listen. And I've seen you listen intently. You don't miss a thing. And uh, that's a superpower to have in the room. So I'm glad we connected and we're going to do some more. Well, I appreciate that. I'm glad that you joined me on this podcast again. Again, thanks for joining us on this episode. I really appreciate you sharing, you know, your story and your real estate journey with us so far. And like, I, I think I said this to you before, but I can really feel your energy. I feel your momentum. I know you're going to kill it. And it's, I love this team approach you're, you're bringing because it's just like, I think you're going to bring a lot of people up with you. It's going to be a fun ride. You know, it's gonna be a fun ride. Yeah, it's, it's just, gonna be a fun ride. Your your drive and like your passion is very infectious. So like that's those are things that I noticed about you. So I wish you all the you know success as you build your you scale up this business. Um, obviously, we're gonna be connected through GoBundance and Commercial Academy. No, absolutely. So to my listeners, feel free to reach out to Maurice directly if you have any more questions for him. Also, thanks for checking out this episode of the School of Cashflow. And remember to leave a podcast review on iTunes as it helps me attract even more great guests just like Maurice. So until next time, live life abundantly. Thanks for listening to another episode of the School of Cashflow. We hope you enjoyed our deep dive into all the tips and tricks you can use to help you on your passive investing journey. In the meantime, you may visit www.cashflowschoolpodcast.com for more great episodes. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, review, and share. That's all for this episode, folks. See you next time.